Today's lecture is control of gene expression one. We have three aims for today. First, we want to talk about why control of gene expression is necessary. What's the point? How it can be controlled? Also, we want to talk about the manners of gene expression, and then specifically talk about something called the LAC operon. So let's go and get started on number one. So why control gene expression? Well, some genes are always on. In other words, they're always being transcribed into RNA, and if possible, always being translated into proteins. Those genes are called housekeeping genes. Uh, just like you always want to keep your house clean, you always want to have these genes expressed. These are things like tRNAs, rRNAs, ribosomal proteins. Uh, we call their expression uh, constitutive. In other words, it's always on. However, most gene products have specialized roles. They're, always need, they're only needed at certain times or under certain conditions. And what we mean by that is they're only needed uh, maybe in stressful environmental conditions or they're only needed when an organism's growing or when, or, 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 excuse me, or, or when an organism's going through puberty or something like that. Uh, so those are the genes we're going to focus on in this lecture, those specialized genes. What I'd like to talk about is Streptococcus, uh, the same bacteria that Griffith used. So I know this is an experiment we talked about before. Uh, if you have any questions about this experiment, let me know. Uh, but this is the same bacteria we're going to talk about in a second here. So here we go. So uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae. And uh, this has many genes that are dependent upon gene regulation. To give you an idea, uh, the act of these bacteria being transformed, in other words, taking up DNA, the exact same thing that Griffith uh, showed before, is, uh, does require gene uh, expression and control of gene expression. So uh, there's some genes that are basically called uh, these uh, competent stimulating peptide genes. And when they're activated, uh, what happens is, um, ooh, excuse me, back up a second. <laughs> um, so when they're activated, so these, I misspoke actually, so when these, um, these COM genes are activated, uh, what happens is this. Uh, something called competent stimulating peptide, or CSP, is released. So the COM genes are the DNA. This is the protein here. I misspoke uh, earlier on the slide. So uh, these COM genes are activated. This competent stimulating peptide is released. And what happens it, is it binds to receptors on the bacterial surface, and that allows transformation to occur, or DNA to enter into the cell. Uh, you might say, well, what activates these COM genes to start with? Sort of a gap in our story. And what activates them to start with is stressful conditions. And it sort of makes sense, actually. Uh, when bacteria encounter stressful conditions, they want to increase their genetic diversity to ensure that their species would survive. And so uh, stressful conditions activate those COM genes, which enhance, uh, increases transformation or uptake of other DNA. Okay, so that's sort of uh, why we control gene expression. Just one example, just to show you. Uh, but I now I want to talk about the manners in which gene expression can be controlled at the level of DNA. You can see here on the right, we can control gene expression at the level of DNA, at the level of RNA, or at the level of proteins. And um, sometimes this happens simultaneously, sometimes it's not. Uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons later on, but let's focus on DNA for the time being. So before we focus on that, we've got to know some structural, uh, kind of structural, <laughs> some important terms. Uh, so the first term is called structural genes. Uh, these are genes that encode for a protein that does something. Sort of a key way to say it. So I have an official definition up there, but you know, a protein that does something. It's a player. It does something in the cell. Regulatory genes are uh, genes or DNA sequence that encode for RNA or proteins, but these don't do things per se. Rather, what they do is they affect the transcription and translation of other sequences. So that's why they're called regulator genes. So very important, but you know, they don't their protein products don't do anything per se on the cell. The final category is something called regulatory elements. And these regulatory elements are DNA sequences that are not transcribed, but they're very important still because they affect the expression of other DNA sequences. An example of a regulatory element would be something like a promoter. Okay? Uh, these other terms, constitutive, we just talked about. That means always on. Positive, negative control, we're going to save that for a later slide. Okay. So again, let's, let's move through the process here. So whenever we have control of gene expression, we have to discuss DNA binding proteins. And what they do is they bind it dynamically to a, a DNA sequence. Uh, whenever we say binding dynamically, so pretend this line here in the title is a strand of DNA and my cursor is a protein. Whenever we say bind dynamically, what we mean is the protein hops on, hops off, hops on, hops off. So even though it's hopping on and off like this, we would say it's bound, right? We'd say it's bound as long as it's on the DNA more than it's off. So it'd be something like this. Hop on, hop off, hop on again and stays there. Hop off, hop on again, stays there. So on doesn't really mean it's statically on, right? But rather it's dynamically on. So it's just, you know, hopping on and off, but more of its time is spent on the DNA. 
That's important because if we're talking about regulating DNA expression, uh, we have to have the opportunity for that protein that's hopping on and off to be interfered with, right, in order, in order to inhibit expression. So there's three categories, uh, three things that we call motifs. So motifs are just different categories, different shapes of DNA binding proteins. There's something called a helix turn helix, which just has the alpha helix here, a turn in the amino acid sequence, then another alpha helix. Something that's called a zinc finger binding protein, because it looks like a bunch of fingers, right, projecting in. And then when you look at it, it has zinc ions that are stabilizing that structure. And the third one is called a leucine zipper. Uh, all of these are just, you know, different motifs or different uh, categories that uh, some exist in prokaryotic organisms, some exist in uh, eukaryotic, some exist in both. Uh, but they're important in uh, regulating uh, DNA expression. And so you might see this, you know, later on. Uh, one thing I want to note is that whenever you have amino acids interacting with DNA, um, they interact with uh, different grooves, right? So there's a major groove and a minor groove. Uh, the major groove is the large gap in the DNA. The minor groove is the small gap in the DNA. And whenever they're interacting, they're interacting through their tertiary structure or their domain, something we've talked about earlier in this course. Okay, so quick question for you. Uh, domains are hallmarks of which protein structural level? So think about it a second. Hope you're saying three, because I just said it, right? <laughs> so tertiary is the structural level. Uh, they're all important, obviously, but when we talk about domains, really we're focusing at that tertiary level. Okay, uh, and again, if you need a review of the protein structural levels, just you know, go ahead and look through this slide, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, but this is something we covered in an earlier lecture. Okay, so let's talk about uh, something called operons. So bacterial cells are often organized in something called operons. And what we mean by this is an operon is a group of genes. You can see gene A, gene B, gene C. This is a generic diagram here. It's not a real operon, just a generic one. But an operon is a group of genes that are under the control of a single promoter. So think about what that means for a second. They're under the control of a single promoter. What's the implication? And you can see the implication is that they're all transcribed at the same time. Right? That's the implication. If they're all transcribed at the same time, you have one piece of messenger RNA that has the three genes located in it, right? And then they're all translated at the same time, and all these protein products appear in the same ratio at the same time, and hence they're most likely probably used in the same biochemical pathway. In other words, you would never want gene A or protein product A if you couldn't have B. I think of it as like peanut butter and jelly. You know, why would you buy peanut butter from the store if you're not going to buy jelly? They just go together. Um, the other sequence that you see here is something called an operator. And what the operator is, is this is a DNA sequence that overlaps with the promoter and the first structural gene, right? And what it does is it is a landing spot for something called a regulator protein. When the regulator protein binds to the operator, it can either enhance or inhibit the binding of RNA polymerase and, and, and hence enhance or inhibit transcription. And obviously the regulator protein is made from a regulator gene. So that's sort of a generic operon. Later on in the lecture, we'll talk about a specific operon. But I just wanted to sort of show you the nuts and bolts of how that works. Okay, so there's different types of um, transcriptional control that we have to discuss. So there's something that's called uh, negative control or positive control, and then there's inducible or repressible control. Uh, I'm going to tell you the definitions here, but I'll show you in a picture in a second. That'll be a little easier to, to navigate. So if we have, think of it as two questions. So the first question is, is it negative or positive? If it's negative, the negative protein, or sorry, the regulator protein is a repressor. If it's positive, the regulator protein is an activator. Doesn't really say much yet, right? But that's the official definition. So I'll show you a picture in a second. The next question is this. Is expression inducible or repressible? Repressible. If transcription is normally off and you're turning it on, then it's inducible. It's a little easier to understand, I think. If expression is normally off, but you're turning, or excuse me, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> repressible. So if transcription is normally on and you're turning it off, then it's repressible. So it's really what they say. I think of like flipping a light switch on and off. Okay, but let's show you some pictures. So what is negative transcriptional control? So on each of these pictures, what you see is you see a DNA sequence, you see an operon, you see a regulator protein. Uh, you know, expressed by the regulatory gene. And also what you see is you see a before situation on top of the panel and an after situation on the bottom. Same holds true for here, right, before and after. Yeah. When you're asking yourself these questions, you want to say, okay, is it, is it negative or is it positive? Now, the slide tells you it's negative, but why does it tell you that? What about the picture tells you that? 
So for the negative positive question, you want to have tunnel vision. There's one thing you want to focus on a picture, and that's the only thing you want to focus on in a given picture. And this is what that one thing is. You want to look for the regulator protein, and you want to say, in which situation is it bound to the DNA? Where is it bound to the operator? So on the bottom here, you see the regulator protein is not bound to the operator. So I don't even care about that. I'm not even going to look at that for the, for the positive negative question. So I, I focus up here. When it's bound to the DNA, to the operator, what's happening? If when it's bound, transcription's off, it's negative control. End of story. If when it's bound, transcription's on, which is not the case in this picture, right? But if it was, then it'd be positive control. So this is negative. Let's look at this picture. Think about it a second. What would it be? You focus down here, right? When it's bound, transcription's off, so this is also negative. So they appear in different parts of the picture, but, but they're both negative. Okay, let's look at the second question. Are these inducible or repressible? This is going from off to on, so you're turning something on, it's inducible. On this side, we have transcription going on from off, so it's repressible. Okay. Uh, something else I want to uh, point out is that sometimes the regulator protein binds, sometimes it doesn't bind. See here, it is a DNA binding domain, it can bind. Here it doesn't, right? So it cannot bind. And so, um, wh why did that happen though? Wh wh why the conformational change in the protein? When a substrate binds to something called the allosteric site, and allo in Greek means other, uh, if, if the substrate is binding to the allosteric site, we call it an allosteric effector. You see at the bottom of the screen here. When it's bound, it can change the conformation of the DNA binding domain. And either it can do either one. It can repress binding of the regulator to the operator, or it can enhance it, either one, depending on the scenario. But that's another uh, little term that you want to know. OK, look at these pictures and just look through, and you should think, why is it positive? Why is it negative? In this case, they're both positive, right? Uh, why is it inducible, or why is it, why is it repressible? So go ahead and look at that, just so you can understand why. Okay. So why is this positive? Well, when the regulator is bound, transcription is on. That's why it's positive. Why is it inducible? We're going from off to on. How about this one? Why is this positive? When the regulator protein is bound, not bound here, I can't look at it, right? When it's bound, transcription is on, so it's positive. And then I'm going from on to off, so it's repressible. Okay, so we talked about the nuts and bolts of how these work. Let's finalize today's lecture by focusing on a specific operon called the LAC operon. Okay, so just to build the suspense, here's the LAC operon. Okay, so there's a situation here where bacterial cells need um, glucose, right? They need glucose for energy in order to, to, to survive. So what happens is bacterial cells bring in something called uh, lactose. So here's outside the cell, here's inside the cell, right? So outside the cell is extracellular, inside is intracellular. But what it does is the bacterial cell brings in lactose through a protein called permease. So the job of permease is to bring lactose into the cell. Once lactose is in the cell, an enzyme called beta-galactosinase converts it in two ways. It processes the lactose first to allolactose, that's one scenario, right, for the reason we talked about in the previous slide. And then also what beta-galactosides can do is process lactose into galactose and glucose, again, for energy for the cell. So that's what beta-galactosidase does. Uh, permease and beta-galactosidase are proteins that are produced by same gene, by, by, sorry, by different genes in the same operon. You can see why they're needed at the same time. Uh, there's a third uh, protein called transacetylase, but we don't really know what that does. Okay, so the whole lac operon is depicted on this slide. And what I encourage you to think of is this up on top of the red line is the same thing as this at the bottom. Except at the top is when there is no lactose in the cell, so absence of lactose. At the bottom is when there's presence of lactose in the cell. Uh, and just think of this line as sort of, uh, you know, before and then after. Okay, so let's look at this. So before there's lactose in the cell, the regulator protein is binding to the operator, so it's called a repressor, and transcription's off because it's blocking RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase cannot, cannot bind onto the promoter as it would like to. Uh, that physical blocking is called steric hindrance. Okay, so that's it. End of story, right? There's no transcription, there's no translation, nothing happens. Okay, let's look at the bottom scenario here. So what happens is um, when there is some lactose in the cell, beta-galactosidase will convert that into, some of it at least, into allolactose, 
Uh, allolactose will, will bind to the allosteric site. It will change the DNA binding domain on the repressor. The repressor can no longer bind. Now RNA, RNA polymerase can bind, and transcription does occur. Transcription and translation. You get all these products, right? You get beta-galactosidase to process lactose uh, into allolactose and glucose. You get permease to bring lactose into the cell. And then transacetylase, we don't know what that does. Um, and so each of these th three structural genes, you want to know that, you know, LAC-Z is the gene that produces beta-galactosidase when it's able to. LAC-Y is the gene that produces permease when it's able to. And LAC-A is the gene that produces transacetylase when it's able to. Okay, so that's the lac operon. That's how it works. Uh, we want to think of this. What is it? Is it positive or is it negative? Well, when the, the um, repressor is bound, there's no transcription, so it's negative. Next question. Is it inducible or repressible? Well, we're going from off to on, right? No transcription or transcription, so that's inducible. One final thing I want to mention about the lac operon is this. You might have noticed a problem in my logic, or a circular logic, if you will. In other words, how can you possibly um, get production of permease, right? Because lactose has to be in the cell to get permease, right? How can you get production of permease when you need permease to bring lactose into the cell to start with? See how it's sort of a problem? It's like circular logic. And the answer is really this. The answer is that when we say no transcription, we don't really mean no. We mean low or very, very little transcription. So there's always a trickle of transcription allowed to get this process started. I think of it as a light switch not being on or off, but more like a dimmer light switch that you see in someone's dining room. You know, when you turn it off, it's just really dim. Uh, so that sort of that solves that chicken and the egg problem. Okay, so that's control of gene expression one. If you have any questions, please let me know.